So do you ever wonder what's happening when you turn your key on and crank the engine? What's all happening there? Well, there's spark plugs that are firing, fuel injectors that are pulsing, the ECM is controlling it all, and also there's a starter motor that first initiates the crank. We're going to talk about the starter motor specifically today and how that all works. So the key. You can see the starter drive gear sitting in, in proximity to the flywheel, yet it's not, not engaging the flywheel. So, so when you're in a car and you turn the key, what's actually going to happen is the power is sent down the line to a special little terminal that sits on the solenoid. We have power in the starter via battery cable. Solenoid, when triggered by the ignition switch, will allow power to go from the battery cable into the starter to make it turn over. Additionally, the solenoid will cause the starter drive gear to be pushed out into contact with the flywheel. So as soon as you hit the key, starter drive comes out and you let go of the key, it comes back in. Now we're gonna to go to the bench and look in more detail at how that works. I've got a couple Chevrolet starters on the bench right here right now, one that's been cut away. And we'll talk a little bit in more detail about some of the parts inside of that. I'm gonna start on this Delco starter here, which is a regular Chevrolet starter used on small block engines. Now 350s and 305 style motors of uh, older generation 350s in the 1970s and early 80s. Now, a couple of the parts I wanna get you to be aware of. We have our starter housing right here, the main body of the starter. We have what we call a nose housing section of the starter. We have an end housing right here, or the end cover. And we have the starter solenoid, which is going to be responsible for helping bringing out the starter drive on the end over here. And there's a starter drive gear that you can see inside right there. And that starter drive gear has what they call an overrunning clutch behind it that allows it to grab one way and slip the other way. So, so the overrunning clutch is gonna prevent that uh, starter from over ribbing when the engine starts up and it'll actually uh, slip to prevent the overspeeding of the internal armature on there. In that section right there is a large switch with a contact made of generally copper that allow that top terminal from the battery cable to send its power internally into the starter. Okay, now over in our cutaway here, you can see the internal parts. You can see right here, when I pull on this solenoid, there's a plunger going into the solenoid. There's a lever going down. That's going to cause the starter drive to come out. Now, that lever goes down into a collar right on the starter drive assembly. And it's going to push that starter drive out. That part right there is the overrunning clutch. Now, if we look at the back of the solenoid section here, you can see that switch I was referring to earlier. It's right there. This one's got a... A plate this one's actually i think got a zinc coating over top of a copper in there and when you press on this you can see that switch moving back there's that coil winding inside the solenoid it's going to pull back on the plunger when that plunger goes all the way back it's going to make contact internally with the terminals sending power from this terminal to that terminal there which is then sent down into the starter motor to the brush assembly inside So the power, when we energize that with the ignition switch, is gonna energize the winding inside the solenoid, pulling the plunger back. The plunger will activate the starter drive on the end, but it'll also cause that big switch in the back of the solenoid to, to join that upper terminal to that terminal. So the battery cable power will be sent down into the starter motor itself, powering up the brushes and also the, the perimeter pole shoes, which then with the magnetic field being built up inside the starter will cause the armature to rotate. Okay, when a starter is connected in the car, we have a battery cable that's connected to the big terminal on top of the solenoid here. Now, the power is not going anywhere. It's just sitting there because inside the internal solenoid switch isn't allowing the power to get into the motor. We're gonna have to energize that to make it happen. Now, the starter, motor itself is generally grounded through the engine block. So we're gonna put 
our battery cable right on the starter so we can make that starter turn over. Now our ignition switch source comes down to a terminal on the solenoid. So you can see that little pull-in terminal down there. We're gonna connect to that, but because we got a power source right here, we're gonna use that. I've got a little remote switch here we're gonna use to simulate the ignition switch, which, so we'll turn the power on. I want you to watch what's happening to that switch back there at the back of the solenoid when I hit the ignition switch. Initially, what's first happening is the motor doesn't actually turn over until this comes back. And once the power is joined from there to there, then the motor turns over. So you can see what happens with this business end of the solenoid. There's a lever coming down attached to the plunger. In the middle, there's a pivot point, like a fulcrum point. And right there, there's a fork on the end of the lever, which is going to activate that little collar on the starter drive assembly. This will push the starter drive out into engagement with the flywheel. So let's hit the ignition and watch what happens. You see the starter drive being pushed out and it's also retracting it when we let go of the key. So now you can see there's one brush assembly exposure. There's actually four on the end and the brush assembly is actually contacting something called a commutator. The commutator sits right on the end and we're going to pull apart and take a good look at that. So let's trigger the ignition switch and watch what happens back there. Okay, we'll take the starter apart here. First place I wanna go is to take the solenoid off the top of it. Just gonna turn this solenoid so it can come out of the starter housing assembly, there's a tab right there that will release it and you can, you can see the spring that goes on a plunger and that spring helps push the solenoid back out of the cylinder of the solenoid when the electromagnetic field is released or when we take the power away from the solenoid windings. Now you can see how that plunger when we move it moves that little lever across and moves that starter drive in and out. Next thing we're going to do is remove these back bolts on that starter housing. Okay, now these are called through bolts right here, and uh, essentially because they go through the starter assembly itself. There's your end cover, and there's a bushing inside of that. We generally want to put a little bit of lubricant in there when we rebuild starters. And now we can simply see inside the, the brushes that are responsible for providing the current to the armature inside. So there's gonna be two powered brushes. You can see they have a special plastic type material that insulates them from the body. So they're insulated brushes. And those are the positive brushes. These other ones, which are connected to the body of the starter are the negative brushes. Power travels to both the pole shoes, which are perimeter magnets, four of them. And also in this case, there's four, there may be more in some starters. And also it travels to the insulated brushes, two of them. Separate it. And right now you can see the starter assembly coming apart. You can see the armature assembly. And you can see how inside of the nose housing, that fork and plunger work together to move the starter drive internally. Now we're not gonna take this out, we'll just leave that there. But you can see also, if you look deep inside, a bushing back there that helps stabilize that end of the armature and uh, keeps it nice and centered in that starter. Now, if we tip this starter housing over, you can see in here what we call the pole shoe assemblies. And so these pole shoes are wired in parallel. You can see the power coming in from the terminal. It splits, sending power to one set of pole shoes and then the other. And then the power comes out halfway between and it runs over to the positive brushes. The power then runs from the positive brushes through the armature's commutator strips, connects it to specific windings, which then runs through a segment of the armature. Then the winding comes back to another commutator strip, 
which goes to a ground. So our brushes, our positive and negative brushes, are 90 degrees to each other. Power comes in, goes through a winding, comes out at 90 degrees to a negative brush. And we also have that on the other half of the armature itself. All right, so at one point, there's always four of these armature poles that are energized. And there's also four points within the housing, the pole shoes that are energized. So, so that repulsion and attraction of the magnetic fields within that pole shoe and the armature assembly is gonna cause that rotation of that, of that starter assembly. Whenever you check a starter, really important to do this, grab your starter drive, make sure it can only spin one way, slips the other, that's what it's supposed to do. If you ever come up to a starter and you grab the starter drive and it slips two ways, that won't turn your motor over. And it's a, quite a common cause of a car not wanting to turn over. If you ever want to replace a starter drive on the end, it's pretty simple. You're gonna just mount this in the vise and we're gonna remove this little washer on the end. There's a little retaining washer with a little ridge on there, so make sure you pay attention to which way they go. And that was specific to Chevrolet, and, and there's actually other companies that use that besides Chevrolet, this method. And there's a little cup-style retainer here with a circlip inside that we have to release. Now you can just use a plain punch to knock that retainer down. We've got a special tool that is meant to fit over that shaft that we manufactured that basically allows that to simply go on the end. We give it a tap and it drops the retainer off, off this circlip. Some people use a socket. It works quite well too if you've got the right size of socket. Now we're just going to go underneath that little circlip, sp spread it a little bit and lift it. Now this isn't a snap ring, so you don't need a snap ring plier, but you do have to work it a bit with your screwdriver. There's your circlip. Then you can remove the little retainer and it's got a little cup shape to it, so make sure you put it the same way when it goes back together. And then what you have is the ability to take off that starter drive itself. Now the starter drive fits into a helix. It's got a shaped spiral going down on the spiral spline going down there. And what we want to do is clean that really well and lubricate that with something like LubriPlay or white lithium grease works really, really well. Okay, we're just going to wipe that shaft really well, clean it all up. Uh, you may have to take it to the solvent and, and clean it up really good if it's... Uh, if it's dirty. Now you want to make sure you inspect it, make sure there's no damage on it that can cause that starter drive to hang up. And this one is in really good shape, so we're good to go. We're going to take a little white lithium grease, run it over the shaft, and we're going to put our starter drive back on there. Now we'd replace this with a new starter drive. Obviously this one is just a practice model, so it's still good, but we put it back on there. Oh, also, by the way, you want to look at the condition of the starter drive teeth at the end. Sometimes they chip or they break off. It's an indication that you have to replace it. This one-way clutch in here we know is good, so we can say this is good to put back on. So first step, put the cup back on. Next step, take yourself your circlip, and if the circlip is a little too spread, close it up a little bit yourself with a plier. Push it back on. Now I will use my tool that I created for that to push it back into the spot that it needs to be. Now it's back in its groove. I will take the retainer on top, take two pairs of pliers, one on each end, and give it a squeeze, and it should pop right back together, and that starter drive is now reinstalled back on the armature. Now another thing you want to look at when you're inspecting the starter is the condition of the armature itself. Now we want to look particularly at the end, this part called the commutator, you can see that this one has actually been dropped. There's a dent on the end of it. Now, I don't know that that's gonna cause this a problem. I think what I would do is take a file and clean up that end there. We wanna make sure that no strips on that commutator, those little copper strips are merged together because that could short the armature out. Now, we need to take and look really carefully at how rough that commutator is right there. So commutator really is a rotating switch. One positive brush sits on a commutator strip and at 90 degrees there's a negative brush that sits on another commutator strip completing the circuit of a, one specific winding. Now when you energize one winding we create a magnetic field in that part of the armature pole and there's four poles being energized at the same time. As we rotate a little bit the positive brush comes out of contact and the negative comes out of contact with, with its 
existing strip and it now goes on to the next one that is lined up in sequence. So we charge a winding, we pass the duty on to the next winding as it moves a little bit and it can carries on passing its duty one winding to the next and that maintains maximum force between the uh, armature poles and also the pole shoes that sit around the outside of the starter housing itself. Now one thing we got to do when we also check the starter is check the condition of the windings themselves. There's little insulation on these windings, it's kind of a varnish, and if the winding loses its insulation as it passes through the armature itself, it could cause a short within the armature. That will render that armature as basically useless and, and needing replacement. One thing we generally do when we rebuild starters is we take some emery cloth and we clean that up. We sand that area nice and clean. So I'm going to go get some emery cloth. We just check the condition, of course, of that commutator. And if it's serviceable, if it's reusable, then you're going to want to come along and you're going to want to sand that. Now, if that commutator is badly worn, it may not be at a point where we could reuse it, but this one's nice and straight. The uh, commutator strips are in great condition, so we're just going to kind of want to clean that up quickly with some memory cloth to make that look good. It's not only looking good, we want to take the corrosion off of that so when the brushes run on it, it gets maximum contact and it can pass the currents from the brushes assemblies to the to the windings inside the armature. Okay, what you have in front of you is a growler. Now this machine, you don't see them around too much anymore, but what a growler is a machine that has two poles on it that are electromagnets when we turn it on. And if we place the armature over top of it, we're gonna send that magnetic field into the armature and it's gonna start generating some voltage out of the windings and sending it to the commutator strip. The other thing we can use it for is check if there's any shorts in the particular armature. So if we turn it on and we use it in conjunction with a hacksaw blade, if there's shorts that are gonna show up, it's actually gonna make the blade stick, so. And there's no sticking going on, so I know that there is no shorts on that armature. So that one test, it passes. The other thing we can do is grab these red probes. Now these red probes give us a voltmeter and if we place the red probes on the commutator strip and we're gonna actually take the very top commutator strip, skip one and go to that commutator strip and we're gonna measure the voltage output on it. We can see if there's any opens in the windings. So if it doesn't generate voltage in the windings, that's telling us we've got an open winding. So we'll just turn it on and we'll watch for a voltage output. So that's nice and high on there. Rotate it one segment at a time, and we're going to check the voltage response of every pair of commutator strips as we go around. So you can see those three or four that I've tested there are generating voltage. I want to be checking all the combinations all the way around, but so we just quite quickly checked for opens in the armature as well as grounds. There's another test I'd like to do on the armature here. If we touch the center of the armature and we go around each individual commutator strip, at no one point should we see any continuity between the commutator strips and the center portion of the armature. Otherwise, that would indicate a short to ground, and we don't have that, so that's good. So using a ohm meter is really easy to check if these brushes are properly connected to the ground and also if they're properly connected to the power source coming in off the solenoid. So I'm just going to check my ground side first. I'm going to touch the probe to the negative side of the starter housing and I want to make sure that my negative brushes actually are going to make their way continuity wise to ground and that one does as does that one over there. We shouldn't see any continuity between the insulated brushes and the grounds. We don't there and we don't there. So that's good. Now I'll do the same on the power terminal coming in. For uh, I'm going to make sure that the negative brushes don't show any continuity to the positive side, and they don't there, nor does that one. So that's good. So, so no shorting occurring between the negative brushes and a positive terminal. Now the positive brushes should have continuity going to the positive terminal, and it does on that one. 
as well as that one there. So I know that my brush assemblies are in good shape over there. And also when I did that, I also checked the pole shoes at the same time for shorts and opens. On the solenoid, we wanna make sure that the winding has got continuity between where the ignition wire comes in and where it comes out to the body of the solenoid. So we should see continuity and resistance on that solenoid. And this one's showing about 0.9 ohms of resistance, which makes sense for the size of winding that's inside of there. So that's a good winding. Additionally, if we take alligator clips and join them between the big terminals, I should be able to push that inside and see if that switch can go on and off. And it does. So I know that the switching portion of the solenoid is also working. You now putting a starter together is fairly easy. You're gonna to need to have a little bit of grease to allow the bushings to be lubricated in there. And one of the first places we go after, of course, cleaning it would be to put the grease back into the bushings. I'm gonna run a little grease into the end point. You can also put a little bit on the end of the shaft where it goes in. What I like to do is just take my finger and place that over top the end of the plunger. Make sure you get the solenoid fork back in the starter drive collar there. Now what you can do is take that pin out and put this in of course separately after so it's up to you but it, it does go in without having to do that. Okay now what I want to do is also put a little grease in the end of the end cover. Also around that shaft a little bit. And it can be a little tricky at times to do, but I go over usually okay. Sometimes it doesn't hurt to have a second person do that. Now, these have to be situated in such a way that that little terminal lines up with the center of the plunger here. There is a little uh, fiber washer or leather washer that goes on the end over here after you make sure that that's on there. And then we're going to put the end cover back on. And I think they go right about right in that area. You're going to have to feel for those through bolts to line up with the threads in the nose housing. And that's where they fit. And you can then install the solenoid end spring. I put the spring back on the solenoid plunger. And you're going to Take your solenoid, that tab has to spin into position, so you're gonna put it in about a quarter turn out of alignment and then just simply turn it in so it locks in the bottom side of the housing there. And the last thing you're gonna be putting on is your rear spacer that goes between the uh, terminal that goes into the starter motor and the solenoid itself. You're able to bench test that starter as well. So let's bench test it, make sure it works. We'll connect our power supply to the starter, putting the ground on the body of the starter. We'll connect the power supply to the back of the starter, being careful not to let it touch the other terminal on the bottom. We'll put a, a remote starter switch on this S terminal on the solenoid and one on the actual power supply going in. And then you're gonna hit the trigger and make sure that the starter operates. Now I can see the starter drive coming out on the end and it turns over nicely. So I've got a functioning starter here.